walk of ages, I'm safe within his shelter. I will be the winds may blow and the angry storm all around me rages. I'm one this rock of ages, I shall stand. I stand upon the blessed holy rock of ages. I'm safe within his shelter. I will be the winds may blow and the angry storm all around me rages upon this rock of ages i shall stand hide me o the rock of ages till my blessed face i see when the storms around me rages rock of ages hide thou me though the storm around me rages solid is the rock of ages i stand upon the blessed holy rock of ages i'm safe within his shelter i will be the winds may blow and the angry storm all around me rages upon this rock of ages i shall stand on christ the Blessed holy rock of ages, I'm safe within his shelter. I will be the winds may blow and the angry storm all around me rages upon this rock of ages. I shall stand. We have been in a sermon series for the past while, several weeks, a bunch of weeks, and we have really taken a look at what it means to be made to make a difference. Looking at the book of Acts, it gives us an opportunity to, to take a look and to say, church, what does it really mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be the difference in the world? If we were to try to figure that out on our own, we would probably make up all kinds of stories. We're good at that. But to look at the book of Acts teaches us what that is like. I don't mind saying that I believe that the focus of our church is to live out the gospel. That is who I feel called to be as a pastor and, and called to be your pastor. I feel like that's what we're supposed to focus on, living out the gospel. And what does that mean? Well, the blueprint to me for loving others to love Christ is spelled out as we have gone through we take a look and to, as to summarize where we've been and where we've come from. Acts 2, we see the Holy Spirit coming down upon those who were gathered together. And like tongues of fire spread across, Peter, the fisherman, breaks out in a message, in an amazing message. Some of us went to school for a long time to be able to, to preach like that, and here he breaks out. Go Holy Spirit. But it doesn't happen without the Holy Spirit working in and through him. Acts 3, we found Peter and John walking along on their way to the temple because it seemed natural for them. That's what you do in the middle of the day. And walking by, they see uh, a man who is li uh, lame that is sitting next to the temple or to the gate beautiful. And they didn't have anything to share with him that you would think that he needed, like alms or any kind of monies, but they gave him what they had. And that was the blessing of the Spirit, the blessing of the gospel. Him dancing around later and talking with people, it spreads and thousands are giving their lives to Christ. We saw in Acts 4 that persecution didn't deter the disciples. They kept on preaching and pointed to the miracle of this lame person walking again. It didn't detract from what they were wanting to do and what they were trying to do as the church. 
Acts 5, we find that all were given their lives were without need, even though some were maybe trying to twist that a little bit to make themselves look better than they actually were. Ananias and Sapphira were going to give their property to the disciples so that they could do, but they, they kept a little bit back for themselves, even though they said they gave it all. And it's basically we see that when we give our lives to Christ, it's all, and let God deal with the rest of it. Acts 6, we see that the early church was carrying on in this new way, this sharing the gospel, the loving others, and issues were brought before the disciples, saying, hey, these Hellenistic Jews, they, their, their um, widows weren't being taken care of. We're leaving them behind. We don't do that. So they stopped what they were doing. They found those that could solve the need and meet the need, and they went back to doing what they were supposed to be doing, and that was sharing the gospel. And in so doing, teaching us, that's what it's like to live the gospel. In Acts 7, we understand that the church will always be a mess if we find ourselves focused on our wants versus the mission that is set before us. When Stephen was moments away from death, beyond <clears throat> anything he could imagine, opposed by a hostile stiff-necked group, he refocused on his original vision. Even looking at death in the face, he focused on God and why he had been called to this place in time where he was in his life. In Acts 8, we looked at the idea that all too often we think of these walls, and this is a sanctuary as a safe place for people to come to, to step out of the world, when ultimately the sanctuary was thought to be the place where God hung out. We live and love an amazing God, and it's really the world should be coming into a place like this. Because this is the answer for the world. This is the sanctuary where God will show up and God is already. And so the world needs to be a part of that. If we help build for ourselves walls that keep others away from knowing and loving God, we need to tear that down. If we have built walls around ourselves that will keep others from us from knowing the true self that we have, we need to tear that down. If we have built the walls around ourselves, then rather than telling God's story, we need to tear that wall down. It's what we learn from Acts 8. Acts 9, we learned that there are so many ways that we can make excuses for not being a part of the church. We had a little fun with that. But we learned that there was one person that had all the excuses in the world not to be a part of the church and follow God's will that day. God called this another Ananias, to go to this guy named Saul. Go to Saul, and I want you to let Saul know what it is that I'm doing in his life. This is the same Saul who was breathing out, breathing out murderous threats. The guy that was calling out Christians all over the world and, and was tearing them down, tearing them apart. Ananias could have had every excuse to say, God, I'm not your guy for this one. But he didn't. He went forward, and he said, all right, God, I'll do this. He might have feared him, but he said, Lord, you are bigger than my fears, and I'll go ahead and step out in that way. Acts 10, we learn that, that fear is the absence of faith, Paul Tillich writes to us. God is bigger than our fears, and we have to trust that. As we grow to be the church, we need to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. This is what it is like to build ourselves up in the church. What we learn from going back through this synopsis and where we have been in our walk is to understand that as we build the church, we've been building this church for 90 years. And there's 90 more, maybe 180 more, whatever it is, whatever God wishes to be built. But we build this church on this kind of foundation that the Holy Spirit must come. The Holy Spirit must dwell within us. We must focus on our outward efforts as to what God would have us do in this world. That way we can understand how God would have us step into it and not just step past it. We are made to make a difference in the world is what we learn from this. I thought about where we have been in our message yesterday. Uh, I thought about it a lot. We live in a condo where all of the outside walls are glass. So I thought of the church, and while well, we were cleaning windows, we didn't finish. 
Let me, let me say it that way. And we worked really hard at it. I, I talked to Dave and June about that. That's what we were going to do. And, oh, my gosh, there were a lot of windows. But I thought about the windows as we were cleaning them. Clearly, they were set up so that we could see God's beauty around. And, and we do get to. But by cleaning the windows, we're able to see the beauty even more. And we're able to see out so much more. Friends, this is why the church takes a look at itself. Not that anything is being done wrong. But it is if we do understand more and live into more what the Holy Spirit can do in our lives, we then have the ability to see the beauty of God's world even more. And we see things that maybe we didn't quite understand. Today, as we, we close off our conversation on made to make a difference or close off the conversation of the beginning of what we take a look at to make made to make a difference, I think it's a perfect culmination that we find in Acts 17. Paul is going about doing his Paul thing, and nobody does Paul like Paul does, right? Wherever he goes, he is preaching the gospel. It doesn't matter where he is. He's in Areopagus, and, and he's sharing with these guys. It's another word. The Greek word means Mars Hill. And he comes around all of these people. It's a very philosophical area where all kinds of ideas are shared. Friends, I think this is a perfect culmination of where we are in Made to Make a Difference because this is a lot like our world today. There are so many philosophical ideas that are going on today for us to consider. Consider this, consider that. It was almost as if these folks that were at this area, at Mars Hill, Area Pegasus, that they would take a look and they would say, okay, well, what new can we think about? It's almost like they didn't even want to think about what they thought about yesterday and grind on that a little bit. They want to know new thoughts. They want to understand new thoughts. We live in a world very similar to that. And what I love that Paul did was Paul's story didn't change. His method did. But the story didn't change. The gospel didn't change. The gospel was still the same answer for them in that moment as it is for us, as it was for Stephen as he was being stoned, as it was for Ananias as he was going to see Paul the conqueror. The Terminator, I think is what I called him. But we see Paul coming before him. And first verse, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city that was full of idols. Our text says distressed, but it really doesn't give it enough credence for what he was really feeling. He was angry. He was upset. This fought against every single bit of his being as to who he was. Nothing that was going on in this area agreed with him as a person. You know you've met somebody like that before. You know you've, you've gotten along and, and you've talked with someone that they come out of left field with some kind of thought and you're thinking, no, 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 no. That's not how I think about that. I have met those that aren't Cubs fans. I've had that feeling before. That they couldn't understand baseball if you're not a Cubs fan, right, Ori? Right. This trust doesn't cover where he was with this because it fought against everything he did all day long. As we think about that, how, how, how would you handle stepping into a lion's den of sorts, a physical thought that is absolutely opposing to how you feel? How would you handle that? Would you get upset? Would you immediately start talking about how people are wrong? Would you, would, would you get angry and, and just wash them off and say, look, I don't need this. I'm out of here. It says in verse 17 how Paul handled this situation. And it's how we are to think about this as the church. It says, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as the marketplace day by day, those who happened to be there. Anybody. I like how it says that. Those who happened to be there. He reasoned with them. To reason with someone is to find a common ground. To reason with someone is to put yourself in their place to understand where they're coming from in order to know how you can direct someone with letting them know that you might feel differently. He didn't tell them how to feel. He reasoned with them. He met them where they are. Doesn't our loving God do the same with us? 
in a certain sense, that God is unshakable, but God meets us where we are. God comes into our life and said, look, I get why you think that's the way it is, and I can't speak for God, but this is my imagination talking. But this is how it is, and this is how I want you to understand this. Paul didn't yell at them. He didn't argue. He reasoned with them. There's always two sides to every conversation. I find that hard to believe when I'm having a loud conversation with someone. But there's always two sides. And then I think what Paul is introducing to us, and then then there's the third side. Somewhere in the middle. You bring two cultures together that think about something differently. The thought remains the same. The conversation that he brings to them is, who is the loving God? He stuck to his usual pattern as it shares with us. And he shared with these people, again, that, that really want to understand something new. I love how they responded. I mean, I, I look at these Epicureans and Sto- Stoics, uh, that, how, how they responded. Verse 18, what is the babbler trying to say? <laughs> I can promise you that I have had conversations in public, and, and I've had people, what in the world are you talking about? I didn't ask you to talk about Jesus. Well, that's kind of who I am, so it's going to happen. What's this babbler talking about? I I mean, can you imagine someone going up to Paul and calling him a babbler? Did they know who this guy was? The Terminator? To call him a babbler is is to suggest that you're you're just saying stuff. It makes no sense. What are you doing? We have to understand where they're coming from. For... The Epicurean, everything about them was materialistic. Everything about that they were were all for. They didn't believe in any kind of afterlife. They were superstitious. The Stoics, on the other hand, believed very much in a divine providence. They very much believed in, in a logos, in an idea that the fullest potential when they had lived would be as they grow older, and then they they pass along spiritually. Paul coming in and talking with them had to be talking a language that they really couldn't understand. It was new. It was something different. But it was something that they they clearly thought was, maybe the, the Greek can be translated baloney. But it says at the end of 18, Paul was preaching the good news, the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. In this opportunity, maybe if Paul were the kind that likes to be liked by others, he might adjust his conversation a little bit, but it just shares that he shared the good news. Even knowing what these folks were like, knowing that maybe they might not accept it, knowing that these folks don't believe in an afterlife. They don't believe that anyone could be raised from the dead. I love that it specifically says that he was speaking about the resurrection. But you know, these folks that welcomed him as the babbler, something happened. Something beautiful took place. In verse 19, they took him and brought him to the meeting, and they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? May we know? It's one thing to think of someone as a babbler, someone that's making no sense in anything they're saying, but then something shifts to suggest we want to know more about what you're talking about. Friends, I call that the Holy Spirit at work. Something changed in their hearts to suggest we want to know. We'll learn later on that some of them agreed that they wanted to hear more later after calling them a babbler again, but some of them followed. And came to understand, look, I I get what you're saying. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Paul then stood up. And and I love that he stands up before these. And he says, I understand that you're very religious. This is him reasoning and understanding where they are. Finding that common ground. And he shares with them that you worship something as unknown. And I want to let you know what it is. And he goes off into sharing the good news. He goes off to sharing an idea and goes through a beautiful discourse. 
scholars have looked at the part that, that Joanne read, and it's a beautiful text that Paul reads and goes from the beginning. This is who God is. This is why he sent his son. This is why his son died. He shares the full length of the gospel in a way that they could hear it. We do this every day with our lives. You all do this all day long in your lives when you walk. You live the gospel. People can come to understand who is your Lord by how you treat them, how you treat others, how you interact, how you are. Clearly, there's an understanding that you live for something greater than yourself when people experience you. I know this because I have experienced most of you. And being new to your crowd, I can understand by the way you act, by the way you treat newcomers, by the way you treat people that I see on and on. I've been trying to capture this in my photography, and it's really hard to do. But to get together with a loving group of folks, this is really what we want to give away to a world. This is what Paul is doing. He's meeting people that are calling him a babbler, and he is sharing the love of Christ with them. He is sharing with them the good news. Why? Because it's the good news that solves the world's problems. Not telling someone how wrong they are or telling someone how you know more about something or telling someone how they should think. He shares with them what God did and then the decision is theirs. The decision is theirs. He goes through and he talks about the wonderful worship of the creator God in the first couple of verses. He goes then through a discourse about the relationship of human beings with this creator. He provides a transition, then capping off the argument of the relationships, and then comes back with the same thoughts. If you can picture it, it's just a beautiful package, beginning with the thought, ending with the thought, and in almost like an accordion, explaining it as he goes through. As he goes through. It's called a chiasm. It's a beautiful train of thought. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them and then tell them what you told them. It's today's adult learning curve. The two things that I want to just make sure we note about what he shared. First was what they worshipped. Paul did not... Paul referred to what they worshipped, not who they worshipped. Their worship was totally wrong-headed. As he came in, if you notice, he looked around and there's all kinds of idols. And Paul let them know that they need to worship this unknown. That where they are focusing their attention, they're missing something. And they're gathering that from him. Second is a strong em emphasis on ignorance. That's meeting them where they are. They're all about the knowledge. Not knowing was worse to them than knowing something that was wrong. And so Paul meets them there. Friends, this is where our world is today. They want to understand. Our world is a very intelligent world that wants to understand and know things, and that's why we are to live sent. That's why we are to go and to understand and to live in the midst. That's why a sanctuary is to be where the world comes in at all costs so that our loving God can let people leave differently than when they came. Paul teaches us to deal with these folks that consider themselves spiritual but not religious. So my question to you is, what's it going to be, church? As we step into this new adventure together, my time with you is still new. Are we going to pray for a Holy Spirit to come to indwell within us? Are we going to recognize problems, find a solution, and continue getting back to sharing the gospel, to sharing the good news? Are we going to not let excuses be the, what drives our day, but we are going to let God's will be done in all that we are? And are we going to step into the groups that may not seem friendly, that may seem to feel and think differently and be a loving group in and amongst them. What do you think, church? Can we be that loving presence that shares, lives the good news to North River Shores and to Stewart? I know that we can. I pray that we will. Let's pray together. 
Loving God, we do thank you that we are wonderfully made. We are made in your image. Help us, loving God, to recognize that those that we come in contact with a regular, on a regular basis are made in that same image. There may be others that think differently, feel differently, act differently, but they are made in your image too, Lord. Lord, give us the courage to let your word be our final answer. Let your word, let your good news be all that we are about. Be with us as we embark in an adventure, in a journey together with you at our lead. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. sing together. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ. He is Lord. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given
let's sing it again. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks. 